Hello everyone and good afternoon. Welcome to the 15th installment or episode of the University of Philippines and the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation's Stop COVID Deaths webinar series where we tackle clinical management updates on COVID-19. I'm Dr. Raymond Francis Sarmiento from the, uh, from the National Telehealth Center of the National Institutes of Health, University of the Philippines, Manila. So today po ay napaka-special. It's extra special because today we will be uh, embarking on the very first episode of our Season 2 for our webinar series. And for today, and starting for today po, we will have a new format as mentioned in our previous webinars. Uh, we will be embarking on what we call the first virtual Grand Rounds webinar series po in the country. So we are really very excited and we look forward to interacting and engaging with our fantastic panel of speakers po. And as always, it is my honor and privilege to share the stage and the hosting duties with a beloved mentor and my partner in crime, the Special Envoy of the President of Philippines for Global Health Initiatives, Dr. Susie Pineda Mercado. Dr. Susie? Hello, Raymond, at magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. Uh, Yid al adha. It is a holiday today, and I think uh, we've got a lot of uh, people with us in the webinar. So, magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. We hope you're all safe and fine with your uh, loved ones and enjoying good health and of course we've got a lot of frontliners and i think i'm gonna i'm going to mention already raymond kasi ano no uh, we have so many people from all over the country and i promised i would say where they're coming from so we have uh from the ramon tugbang medical center in barotok viejo iloilo we have participants from baguio city from Oroquieto City, Oriental, Ox Misamis Occidental, from the University of the Philippines in Manila, from uh, DAR, watching from Quezon Province, from Santa Maria, Bulacan, Carmona Cavite, of course, from the Cardinal Santos Medical Center, Hospital ng Imos, UP College of Public Health, Muntinlupa City, uh, from Cardinal Santos Medical Center, UP Diliman, De La Salle University Medical Center, Antipolo, Andami, Raymond, Valenzuela City, Davao del Norte, the Central Security Hospital of Al Qasim, Saudi Arabia, UP Manila, Lipa City, Batangas, Batangas Medical Center, Philippine Orthopedic Center, Oriental Mindoro Provincial Hospital, Metropolitan Medical Center, UPNIH, uh, Kandihay, Bohol, Angeles, Pampanga, Dagupan, Emilio Aguinaldo Memorial Hospital, Province of Aklan, and dami po. Anyway, I can't read everyone, but throughout throughout the throughout this webinar, we're going to um, acknowledge our different uh, members of the audience because you're part, you're an important part of this team. And of course, um, we have uh, so many watching from the Cardinal Santos Medical Center. Uh, and later on, you'll know why. <laughs> okay, so uh, over to you, Raymond. Thank you, Dr. Susie. So, talaga pong ang dami po talaga nag-tune in. I think that our previous webinars from uh, from Season 1 has really helped uh, para po mapapromote at talagang mapa-enjoy na ang ating iba-ibang mga potential participants. I will mention later uh, that we have registrants from outside of the Philippines and even yeah. from new countries who, uh, who are joining us uh, for this uh, 12 to 2 p.m. na ating Friday habit uh, for our webinar series po. So for today, as mentioned, we'll be starting the very, very first uh, virtual Grand Rounds webinar series po. So ang format po talaga is to bring stories from the front lines po, uh, to be able to show what are the medical and therapeutic uh, and the diagnostic dilemmas that medical teams face, the decisions that they come up with, uh, the lessons learned in terms of the management of the patient, just so that we give sort of um, like a human touch in of how COVID has affected all of our lives. So you will notice po uh, for our participants na para po sa ating webinar uh, series season one, uh, a lot of those have been mostly on uh, talking about the, the theoreticals around it and also a lot of the experiences. But for the virtual grand rounds, 
as uh, as it follows the uh, the parang in person grand rounds po kumbaga it will be focusing on a particular case study so yun po uh, a lot of these case uh, presentations we will have several different doctors which is uh, another difference with our previous webinar series po and also uh, after the presentation of the case we will also have a panel discussion po so that's why you will notice that a lot of our publicity materials uh, at least for the very very first virtual candles have been showing uh, the list of uh, well a pan fantastic panel of speakers po so over to you Doc, uh, dr susie well yes correct raymond and we have a time honored tradition which is grand rounds and for those of you remember from medical school we all look forward to grand rounds because actually it is a point of honesty uh, sometimes in the grand rounds, uh, that's where you 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 actually say that you could have done better this way, or if you had information, you would have done this thing. And so, I think in in the study and the practice of medicine, uh, a lot of our wisdom comes from accepting that it's not always easy to make decisions. There are decisions that have to be made really at the edge of reason. No, minsan. Yung intuition na lang eh, no? Yung intuition ng doktor na, hindi, it, itong gagawin natin, no? And I think we're going to hear a little bit about that today because we have really uh, a very uh, a very interesting case study. And the case study is not being presented by anyone else. The person who is in the case study is going to present his own case and he is such a renowned and respected and loved uh, mentor for many in the field of cardiology, but we won't introduce him yet. So Raymond's going to acknowledge first all the people who have, behind, who have been behind the production of the webinar. And we are just so excited that we got to this point. We could actually try to do virtual grand round. So kumero kami konting palya today, we'll get better next time. It's the first time we're going to try to do it to manage having more than one speaker, and uh, we're going to do our best. Okay, Raymond, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Susie. So as mentioned, po, no, uh, the shift uh, for today's, for starting today for the virtual grand rounds, which will be at least 14, maybe 15 webinars for the season two, po, will be uh, starting from a season one where it, we had a doctor or physician-centered approach. We will, it will be focusing now mostly on the patient. So that will be, if, if you wanted to reframe the mindset po ng mga aten po for our season 2, yun po talaga ang ating takeaway. Uh, please note that we, our, our webinar room capacity is uh, standing room only na po, kumbaga. So virtual standing room only talaga kung napupuno na po tayo, at least for the last month of our series of webinars. And this is really... Uh, a testament to the hard work and we really are very honored and humbled and very appreciative of uh, the teamwork and the hard work that's being displayed po by the UP and the PhilHealth teams and it starts po, uh, let's start at the University of the Philippines system at the Office of the President and Office of the Executive Vice President here in represented by Dr. Teodoro Herbosa and the Office of the Vice President for Public Affairs, Dr. Elena Pernia. We also have Assistant Vice President, Rika Abad. We also have Director Timi Cabana from EMPRO. For our technical assistance or for any technical issues, po, we have ITDC helping us. It's uh, led by Director Paolo Pahe and also assisted by uh, Gabo Villorente and Noel Feria. Po. Uh, we also have our team over at TVUP. Wag po natin kalimutan si TVUP dahil po lahat po ng mga kumakasali sa ating Zoom webinar, they will be redirected to the YouTube channel for the live streaming and also the archive uh, webinar recording po ng ating uh, webinar. So that is in the TVUP channel and TVUP is uh, represented and led po by Professor Emeritus for Mass Communications and also Executive uh, Director Dr. Gigi Alfonso and uh, we also have uh, Angelette de la Pena po, and all, all the team, the, all the members of the team from TVUP po. Over the University of the Philippines, Manila side po, we cannot stress enough uh, the help and the guidance and support 
prepare for this virtual grand rounds po that we have been receiving from the very top po. Chancellor Carmencita Padilla has been very active po talaga in engaging and in uh, essentially coming up po with the ideas for the cases to be presented as well as the UP College of Medicine Dean uh, Dr. Charles Chong po and we also have uh, contributions from the Philippine General Hospital uh, represented and led po uh, by Director uh, Gerardo Legaspi, Dr. Gap Legaspi po and the Deputy Director for Health uh, Operations po Dr. Stella Jose. We also uh, would like to thank uh, the National Institutes of Health, uh, represented po by Executive Director uh, Dr. Eva Maria Cochonco de La Paz. Uh, and over in the field health side po, maraming salamat din po sa patuloy na pong uh, pag-assist sa atin, lalo na po sa ating dissemination and our network of hospitals from the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, represented and led po by President and CEO Brigadier General Ricardo Morales po and also uh, Vice President po uh, Bandi Raselis. So lahat po yun ng mga binanggit ko po, uh, it really is a team effort po and we are really excited to uh, show, show po sa inyo kung paano po ang ating output for, for this virtual grand draws. Very excited na po. Over to you Dr. Susie uh, for that. Thank you very much, Raymond. Raymond, before we go to our uh, introductory speaker, you want to talk about the certificates? We will, we oh, certificates <laughs> again. Okay, yes, yes. So we have been receiving po, no? So uh, for our regular viewers, I know you understand that the certificates po will be emailed. These are electronic certificates, uh, signed electronically, obviously. But along with the certificates, you will be given a link to the slide presentation po of the webinar that you have attended. But that is provided that you attended the webinar at least 50% of the duration po. Uh, yun po ang mabibigyan po ng certificates at ng link po para sa slide presentation. You are free, anybody is free to watch the webinar recording po sa YouTube channel ng PVUP. Uh, but otherwise, yung po makakareceive ng certificates ay yung po at least kalahati po ng webinar duration ay talagang nakatoon po. And then one more thing po, lalo na po sa mga nagtatanong, requests for changes in name, uh, you please be very, very careful when you register for the webinar. Kasi po kung ano po yung in-input po registration, that will be the name that will be reflected in your certificate. So we really uh, encourage everyone to double check po prior to for the registration po. Over to you, Dr. Susie. Okay, thank you. So at this point, we are we are deeply honored to have with us um, somebody who really helped us conceptualize the virtual grand rounds. In fact, when we first talked about it, she said, "Yes, let's do that." Okay, then we were going, "Yeah, how are we going to do this, right?" And so she said, "No, no, no. We're going to get all of the different departments involved." And uh, you know, she just made it happen. So I, it is my privilege and my honor to introduce and to welcome. Uh, the Dean of the UP College of Medicine, Dr. Charlotte Chong. Dean, how are you today? Teka, no, wala yata si Dean. Dean, where are yeah. you? Uh, there you go. Yeah, uh, well, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Susie. Um, the UP College of Medicine is very proud uh, to be involved in this uh, virtual webinar and grand rounds. Uh, it's a dream come true for us to be working with PhilHealth, of, of course, and uh, other components of the university, TVUP, and the Office of the President and Vice President, and of course, the Mass Communication, uh, College of Mass Communication, of course. And, um, you know, the whole UPCM community has been very energized, in fact, uh, whereas COVID can be very anxiety-provoking and can be depressing. Uh, when we decided to be a COVID referral hospital in PGH, the whole community just banded together to make it happen for the country. I think this is a war that we're determined to win. And the whole UPCM community is working hard at it. We have, in fact, around, as I told you before, when we had our webinar uh, yes. the last time, uh, all of a sudden we had, uh, at, at that time, about 180 researches uh, going on. So and, how are the researches? Uh, Dean, kamusta na yung mga research? I remember before you were talking about uh, real innovations, no? including studies on virgin coconut oil and um, some kinds of uh, new therapies. No? Kasi we're yeah. really looking for answers for our, 
for our people. So, kamusta na po yung mga research na ngayon? Well, the VCO is very promising. They already did the first preliminary study on a, on a community in Santa Rosa. And now they're moving on to the clinical trial for moderate to severe COVID patients wow. in PH. Uh, there, uh, there's another study that's still awaiting some funding. That's the Lagundi trial. Wow. And okay. the trial man will be done for those with mild COVID and it will be in quarantine centers, Santa Ana and another one in Quezon Institute. So actually we also have uh, the CBOL, the Surgical Innovation and Biotechnology Laboratory. Tapos na yung sa Sanipad. So we now have like a, uh, uh, a cabinet, you go in and then you get disinfected and now it's being wow. patented by uh, Dr. Edward Wang who's the head of our CBOL. And aside from that, to I can tell you, uh, we, we, of course, the Philippines became a member of the WHO Solidarity Trial, no? So we're, we've been able to get hold of the medications, the remdesivir and all the other medications, because we're part of the WHO Solidarity Trial. And later on, we're also going to be part of the WHO Vaccine Trials. Wow, great, so great. Able to have access also to the, the to vaccines, at least five of them, I think. Great. And just, yeah. just this week, just this week, last Monday, uh, UPCM hosted, um, with of course the support of Chancellor Menchit Padilla, we hosted a roundtable discussion to talk about a roadmap of the country to become vaccine sufficient. Very good. Excellent. So we're uh, working with a lot of other universities to find out how do we actually get to be vaccine sufficient. Galing. And that's yeah. Goal. So Dean, alam mo, for all of those who are listening out there, no, and again, right, I, I'm not able to read, but it's all over the country. I think for a few moments today, we give you a bit of hope, no? parang a glimmer of light, makita nyo kung anong ginagawa natin na marami tayong ginagawa na para sa bansa natin na Pilipino din ang gumagawa. No? Na I think uh, this self-sufficiency in vaccination is going to be really important and very, very happy to hear that this is happening already, Dean. And we are really just looking forward to these regular updates. But there was another thing that you mentioned, no? And I think uh, I'll say it now that while we're starting this grand rounds with uh, with the UP College of Medicine, in the next few grand rounds, we are going to be involving the other colleges of medicine around the country. So this is inclusive. We will involve other hospitals. And other deans who Dean Charlotte is going to call up <laughs> and yeah, to let, so that we really get the whole medical community on the same page and as one, as, uh, as uh, our uh, big boss, Gigi Alfonso, would say, it becomes a community of learning. Yes, for sure. Oh, for sure, sige, yeah. Dean, ano, uh, ano mag message ka na? Yeah, well, actually, uh, the very short message. Uh, we're happy to be involved, of course, and I'm very excited because the the presenter is uh, one of our most respected faculty members uh, from the Department of Medicine, a cardiologist. And uh, you know, when uh, when he became a patient of of COVID, uh, that was one of my defining moments as dean because at that point we already lost a lot of our other faculty and a lot of other colleagues. Pero nung siya magkasakit, talagang sobrang tama sa akin. I was storming heaven with prayers. And we we called everyone because at that point, we didn't have the medica medications yet. Yes. So it was really uh, an effort for the whole college to find out how can we help him. Because yeah. that's how much he, we loved him. And up to now, you know, he's, he's really um, an idol. He's one of the top scientists of Asia. And uh, he's an academician of the National Academy of Science and Technology. And he's the chair of our resource generation office. Wow. He's <laughs> the president of UPMAF, you know, UP Medical yeah. Alumni Foundation yes. Incorporated. And he's the one who's really been hands-on helping us build a 11, an 11-story 11 Henry C. Senior Medical Sciences building that we hope to finish by November next year. You know, without him, I don't know what would happen. So I'm really just happy that he's here with us now to, to give his story. Uh, yun lang masasabi ko. So I'd like to thank your team, uh, TVUP even, and all the others who've been able to bring him in because you know we're here to, to celebrate, to celebrate a victory. And uh, we want to hear his story because I'm, I'm sure we'll have a lot of learnings from that. Even I myself, um, 
learned a lot the first time I, I heard him. And uh, it just shows how much we need to appreciate each other. And it just shows how much we need to give it to the Lord. And I think that's the main message that I would like to say now is thank you. I think it's God's blessing for us to be able to hear him today. Wonderful. Thank you very much. That's that's uh, the Dean of the College of Medicine of UP. And she's going to stay on, I hope, uh, later yes. on for the, for the discussion. Okay, over to you, yes. Raymond. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Susie, and thank you, uh, Dean Charlotte, for that wonderful and inspiring message. So just to uh, use that as a springboard po, ano po, uh, really our virtual Grand Rounds po talaga will be focusing on the lessons learned and by featuring all of these patients po, lalo na po yung ating mga survivors from COVID-19, it really is a testament to uh, parang the prevail, uh, pre uh, prevailing po or the victory of life and great and perseverance po that all of these patients show in or uh, in terms of uh, fighting COVID-19. So thank you po that for, for, for that uh, inspiring and wonderful message, uh, Dean Charlotte. Uh, so before we go on to the actual introduction of our uh, main speaker po, no? uh, may, we have, may we ask everyone uh, to participate in this uh, very fun quiz po that uh, we always put down as uh, pre-webinar questions in our uh, polls. So for today, uh, it's very it's it's a it's an extra special day, po. No? So normally we will have like maybe one or two questions, but uh, you will notice na may ikatlo pong question at least for this uh, virtual grand rounds for today. Uh, so the question, the uh, first question reads: The following are risk factors for increased mortality when afflicted with COVID-19, except option A, comorbid conditions; option B, elderly. Option C, female sex. Option D, obesity. And option E, smoking. So please uh, input po your, your answers po to question number one as we move on to question number two. Question number two states, the cytokine storm occurs during which time period of illness? Uh, option A states, during the first three days. Option B, during the first week. Option C, during the second week. And option D, after the patient gets intubated. And finally, as mentioned, tatlo po ang ating pre-webinar questions for today. That will also mean that we have the same number of post-webinar questions uh, mamaya po. And this question reads, which medication is effective against the coronavirus? Uh, option A, azithromycin. Option B, hydroxychloroquine. Option C, lopinavir, ritonavir. Option D, Remdesivir, and option A, Tocilizumab. So yun po ang ating uh, options and uh, choices po for uh, question number three. And as always, the correct answers po talaga will be provided by our main speaker towards the end of the webinar. So you will note po at least for this webinar, free webinar questions, uh, 82% or around 236 of those who answered uh, selected female sex for question number one, and then for question number two, 42% medyo ano po to, neck and neck. 42% versus 41% for question number two. During the first week, ang mas marami po kaysa dyan, during the second week. So, ang tabayanan po natin, ang tamang sagot uh, towards the end of the webinar. And for the third question, which medication is effective? Coronavirus, uh, we also have um, option D, which is 80% po uh, remdesivir. So yun po uh, ang sagot ng ating mga participants. At so tingnan po natin kung alin po talaga ang tamang kasagutan towards the end of uh, our webinar. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give the floor to Dr. Susie at this point. Dr. Susie? Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Raymond. And they don't need to pass the quiz to get a certificate, right? Yeah, oh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that, this is just a fun quiz. I think... What we do is we ask the speakers to say what are the three or two things that you really want the audience to remember. So uh, it's a learning journey. It's a learning journey and we just put in that quiz para ano ba, reinforce, ano adult learning technique siya. Yes, yes. Hey, Monta, mo, ang cute mo naman naka, ano ko pa, naka headset ka. Parang naingit ako. <laughs> Para po, maali, may, ay, for the sound, ma'am, para mas uh, concentrated po. Pero thank you, ma'am. So, Raymond, I think you're introducing the case study. So, 
Okay, for 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 that for that case study, as mentioned po, um, just to provide context for our participants, we have a very short video uh, that we will be playing. Uh, so please uh, stay tuned at uh, at abayan po natin yung pagplay po ng video that we are waiting prior to the introduction of uh, our main speaker. So I'll 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 give the floor to TVUP for this one. March 7, 2020. It was a day of laughter and sharing of ideas. 24 of the leading cardiologists of the country who were part of the PGH Cardiology Alumni Association had gathered at Clark Pampanga to discuss their plans of a postgraduate course in cardiology in Mindanao this year oblivious of what was to come. Five of them, the past and the current chiefs of the Division of Cardiology of the Philippine General Hospital, Dr. Roddy C., Dr. Raul Hara, Dr. Nelson Abilardo, Dr. John Añonuevo, and Dr. Eugene Reyes sat for a photo a moment in time frozen in their memories before the world changed in ways they are still trying to understand. Of that group of five cardiologists, three were infected with SARS-CoV-2. One of them, Dr. Raul Hara, did not make it. survivors are here with us today. One of them, Dr. Rodisi, will tell his story of his journey and his insights into what it is like to be a patient with COVID-19. Dr. Nelson Abelardo, who also fell ill to COVID-19, will join the panel along with pulmonologist Dr. Camilo Roa Jr who is one of the doctors of Dr. Roddy C. and has been at the forefront of defining clinical management of COVID-19 in the Philippines. No one is spared from COVID-19. Even doctors can get the infection. Yes, Raymond. So that seems to be a very, uh, what should I say, very emotional moment and an emotional way to start this grand rounds. But uh, I guess, you know, when we think about the doctors who are affected, and there were, as of April, about 22 doctors who died. Uh, and currently, we're praying for uh, a number of doctors who are sick, and we should continue to do that. And, and in fact, um, as Dean Charlotte said, you know, in, in, this, in this webinar, we're going to talk about faith and we're going to talk about God. We're going to think about how that is so important for recovery of our doctors. And um, I'm not going to stand between the audience and our main speaker. It is my honor and my privilege to welcome uh, Professor Emeritus from the UP College of Medicine and Academician of the National Academy of Science and Technology, Dr. Rodisi, sir, good morning. Oh, good afternoon, sir. Kamusta po kayo? Okay naman, Susie. Good afternoon to everyone. You're good afternoon, sir, Rodi. Oh, ayun. You're looking so good, sir. Thank you. And, uh, we are just so thankful that you're here with us today. But I was listening earlier and you said you came from a webinar at 10 o'clock. And now you're here on the Grand Rounds. So it looks like you keep a very full schedule. Is that correct, sir? Well, I have uh, cut down already, but uh, there are some important meetings that I, that I still have to attend. Wow. Okay. 
And that's great. And uh, besides, Dean Charlotte said you're in charge of fundraising for the college of <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I, I am sure I am sure that there are many things keeping you busy and we are just really so honored, so privileged to have you here. Raymond. Uh, thank you. So just just wanted to thank you, uh, Dr. Roddy. It's, uh, I, uh, we believe that you have already uh, given this, well, at least to the PGH uh, folks po, uh, for for your take on uh, your journey as a patient. But I think a lot of the lessons and a lot of the, shall we say, the emotional journey po, uh, will resonate with our healthcare workers, not just the doctors, but also other healthcare workers po, who have been afflicted with the disease. Uh, will that will all really be a very inspiring way uh, of uh, understanding uh, where they are in the journey and how they would be able to overcome could overcome COVID-19. So uh, go ahead, Dr. Roddy, with uh, with your presentation, po, sir. Okay. So can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Here. Yes, sir. Okay. Sir, going to go into a uh, PowerPoint. Opa, if opa, if you could go full screen, sir, and uh, opa. go to slideshows. Okay. Yeah. Yes, there we go. Sir. Okay. So again, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for the very kind introduction given earlier. This is actually my third presentation on my illness. I was requested to present first uh, to the uh, staff of the Department of Medicine in UPPGH. Then after that, I was requested by a friend to present in the JC, JCI Senate uh, Manila. So this is my third time to present. I've modified it a little, and then I hope that uh, you will learn something from it. So what I have prepared for today is listed here. I'll discuss first my personal profile, and then go to the source of uh, exposure, which was uh, alluded to earlier. And then I will discuss with you about my illness, the pre-confinement period and then during confinement and all the medications that were given to me and then some personal reflections. So this is my profile, male, I'm 69 years old. I don't know whether I should say myself that I'm elderly. If you have been trained by Dr. Abarquez, his definition of elderly is somebody older than him. So I'd like to adopt that as well. So I don't think I'm elderly because I'm still strong. And uh, I still uh, have, I still work 14 to 16 hours a day. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, the residents, the fellows have a hard time catching up with me uh, on rounds. So I feel that uh, I'm quite strong. Although I have a history of hypertension for almost 10 years now, I'm taking Telmisartan 40 milligrams every day and I'm Lodipin at 2.5 milligram every day. I have diagnosed myself recently as being diabetic or recent onset because of uh, slightly elevated uh, fasting blood sugar and the borderline uh, HbA1c. So I've been taking metformin 500 milligram once a day for two weeks prior to my illness. I have, I have also elevated cholesterol levels, specifically LDL cholesterol. So being a lipid specialist, I'm taking atorvastatin 20 milligrams every day. I happen to have uh, documented obstructive sleep apnea with documented uh, high-grade uh, high AV block during sleep. So uh, I've been using CPAP for the last eight years. And maybe something else, whether related or not, I also have degenerative osteoarthritis, which is understandable at my age. So exposure-wise, no? uh, you have uh, seen the video earlier. I attended a meeting in Clark uh, with uh, members of the uh, cardiology staff uh, uh, in the, uh, the uh, in the uh, in PGH, and there were around 25 of us. Three of the most senior got uh, COVID, and uh, as uh, you have been told already, Dr. Hara did not make it. So Nelson and I uh, were the next most senior, and we got uh, afflicted with COVID. Uh, at that time, I didn't know anything. Uh, I didn't have any symptoms at all because that was uh, probably my first exposure to possible COVID. We were having buffet. I was there at two o'clock in the afternoon. I stayed until eight o'clock. So I was there for six hours. Four days later on March 11, I attended a dinner meeting with uh, doctors in 
a restaurant in Green Hills. There were nine of us and five contracted COVID and three got confined while the other two had, had mild symptoms and just stayed home. So uh, I was still uh, doing my usual work. I was uh, holding clinic for that particular week, even up to the morning of March 14. It was only in the afternoon, late afternoon of March 14, that I uh, noticed a little cough with uh, very minimal phlegm. And the next morning, I developed fever. Around 38, no, I, was take, I tried uh, to take uh, paracetamol, but it was uh, swinging up and down between 12, uh, 38 to 39 degrees. I also have muscle pain, especially on the back. The cough was hardly noticeable. So uh, because of that, I consulted uh, a colleague of mine, an infectious disease specialist in Cardinal, and I, I was advised to go to the ER to get a swab. So I went there as uh, instructed. I had my nasal and throat swabs taken. And at the same time, they did an, a, a CBC and a chest X-ray on me. Uh, they uh, uh, both were turned out to be normal. At that point, uh, I uh, was afraid that I may be afflicted with COVID already. So I stopped Telmisartan because at that time, there were reports that uh, the COVID uh, virus uh, attaches to the uh, ACE2 receptors in the cells, in our cells, especially in the lungs, and may, uh, may have a detrimental effect on the lungs, no? although this, this was uh, negated later on. So because of that, I stopped my telmisartan. I also, I also stopped my atorvastatin because I'm, uh, I was afraid then that uh, it may affect my liver. I also stopped metformin because uh, uh, I felt that uh, maybe I, I didn't need it at that time yet. So it took five days before uh, I was called uh, on the phone by my colleague that uh, my swab turned out to be positive. Uh, at that point, I still have the fever for the, uh, for the interim five years, uh, five days on and off with the myalgia. And again, hardly any cough at all. So I, I was at advised admission. At that point, uh, I also uh, took uh, or Sertalmibir, hoping that it could be simple flu. But uh, again, the symptoms persisted. So on March 20th, I got admitted in the ER. Uh, they did uh, the, uh, all the examinations and they uh, did a chest uh, CT scan instead of uh, a simple chest X-ray. And as you will see on the right side, the two slices from my chest CT scan, uh, it showed uh, infiltrates uh, there and also on the other side. So I have a ground glass appearance of infiltrates in both sides. So uh, I got admitted and I was started on acetromycin uh, orally. And I was also given uh, piperacillin uh, tesobactam intravenously to cover for possible bacterial pneumonia. So uh, the next day, I was in the hospital already with, uh, the, uh, with the same symptoms. I started having uh, diarrhea on the day that I got admitted and it persisted uh, for quite some time. Uh, on my second day, uh, on top of the acetromycin, uh, they wanted to give me chloroquine as well. So I got a baseline ECG. The baseline ECG showed sinus rhythm with a QT corrected interval of 403 milliseconds. This is quite normal. So uh, they gave the go signal to, for me to take the chloroquine at two tablets uh, twice a day, which is the recommended dose. Two days after that, I still have the same symptoms uh, without any appetite, hardly eating. And uh, the diarrhea persisted. At this point, I noticed uh, some shortness of breath uh, after going to the restroom or going to the toilet. Now, because of that, I was started with nasal oxygen. I was advised to do proning or to, to lie down uh, on my uh, belly, but I could not tolerate that uh, because uh, of my cervical arthritis. And at that time, the uh, pillow for uh, proning was the foam pillow, no? was not available yet. So it was very hard uh, to be facing the bed uh, uh, almost uh, occluding your nostril, even when you turn to sides, uh, the pain in the neck would come. So I could not tolerate the proning at all. So uh, again, uh, the medications were continued, but because of my uh, loose bowel movement, 
my attendings decided to change the PIP task to merotenem to see if the, uh, the LBM will subside. Because of my deterioration, because of the shortness of breath, uh, I was given my first dose of to tocilizumab. And upon the insistence of my relatives, no, I was prevailed upon to also start on Chinese medications. They were telling me, I have nothing to lose. No, just go ahead and take it. It may help. So I followed. So with that, the, uh, the following day, uh, the symptoms were practically the same. This was two days after the first ECG because of the chloroquine. They repeated the ECG. Uh, ECG showed an increase in the uh, corrected QT interval to 452 seconds, but this was still within acceptable limits, so the chloroquine was continued. And then uh, two days after that, that was on March 26, this is uh, uh, towards the end of the second week already, I uh, noticed that uh, I was short of breath even at rest. You know? So uh, my uh, respira respiratory rate went up and uh, my usual oxygen saturation by pulse ox uh, from 95 to 98 uh, dropped to around the low 90s. And uh, in the late afternoon of that day, my oxygen saturation even dropped down to 89. And um, in my discussion with my attendings, I was told that uh, if it goes down to 90, we may have uh, to intubate you. No? That's what they told me. Uh, they also did, uh, they took blood, uh, arterial blood from me. The uh, arterial oxygen tension uh, a few days earlier was 75, although it was already on the low side. And on March 26 afternoon, it dropped down to 58. So uh, they were hesitant to intubate me. I was quite awake, a little short of breath. So uh, they decided to try high flow oxygen by nasal cannula. And at that point, they were also considering getting remdesivir for me or Fabipiravir. Uh, both uh, were not available in our country at that time. So uh, my colleagues, uh, especially in PGH, uh, look for friends abroad to see if they can get remdesivir for me. Uh, this is, uh, they tried uh, Singapore, Thailand, Taiwan, and the United States as well. Piravir is actually Abigan available in Japan. So they called up uh, friends in Japan as well to see if they can get uh, this medicine for me. Unfortunately, uh, they were unsuccessful. So on March 27, that's uh, one day after uh, I developed uh, the shortness, shortness of breath uh, at rest, the other symptoms practically persisted. I was still having fever. And uh, because of that, they gave me my second dose of to tocilizumab. And uh, uh, the antibiotic was changed to cetipine. Uh, they were also considering the possibility of uh, doing hemi hemoperfusion for me or giving me IVIG. They also considered the possibility of giving me convalescent plasma, although that was not uh, commonly or widely used yet at that time. No, so, uh, but then uh, I, uh, I was also advised uh, to do the proning again. Fortunately, at that time, uh, a relative of mine got hold to, of uh, an old uh, massage table with a hole at one end. So I was able to lie down with my face uh, uh, facing the hole so that I could breathe. And they were doing the tapping for me at the back. So that helped a lot. And also the incentive in spi spirometry as well. You can see on the right side, the table of my uh, laboratories, the more important laboratories. It was at this point uh, towards the, maybe the latter half of my second week of illness that uh, all the uh, inflammatory parameters uh, went up. My lymphocyte went down to as low as 6 to 14 from a baseline of 24. And then the CRP went up. My LDH went up to around three times the baseline. Ferritin also went up to around three times. And uh, my SGOT, SGTT also went up. So this was uh, taken to be definite signs of cytokine storm uh, in, during my illness. So what comes after that? Uh, fortunately, with the two doses of the tocilizumab and all the other medications and the Chinese medicines as well, I gradually improved yes, in terms of uh, shortness of breath. The uh, 
fever still persisted up to the 10th day. Myalgia gradually subsided. My loose bowel movement did not resolve until the 3rd of April or around two weeks after my confinement. So uh, the, uh, I felt that uh, any of the medications may have helped me. The, uh, the proning uh, during uh, daytime, you know, several times a day, and the pulmonary physiotherapy really helped. You know? So uh, after that, uh, I was redo just simple nasal oxygen during daytime. And uh, you uh, went back, uh, put back on high flow oxygen only at night. It was only the, during the latter part of my uh, confinement that I went back to my CPAP. Swabs were again taken on April 3rd and April 5th. It was only on April 9th that uh, uh, that was a uh, holy Thursday that uh, the swab taken on April 3rd came out and it was negative. So I was finally allowed to go home. So I stayed in the hospital for a total of 21 days. This is just a timeline to show you again what happened, especially with regards to my symptoms. You know? uh, I manifested with fever for quite some time, uh, starting on March 15, lasted uh, for uh, around uh, more around two weeks. And then myalgia almost concomitant with that. I was anorectic for quite a while. And then the loose bowel movement started on my day of confinement and stayed with me or was persistent for around two weeks. I had uh, dyspnea uh, initially on exertion on March 23rd, that's around day four of my Ill illness. And then it deteriorated to uh, dyspnea at rest after three days. The red line signified that uh, I also noticed blood in my uh, expectoration. I have very minimal cough, but on forcing it, I could see some fresh and clotted blood in my expectoration or in my phlegm, and also blood in my stool as well. So these are just representative x-rays uh, on me. The one on the left was taken on day four on March 23. That was uh, after the chest uh, CT scan. I actually have uh, chest x-rays taken almost every other day. And I'm, I just show you the more representative one. So the one on the left showed the infiltrates in both lobes, while on the right, that was uh, two days before discharge, the infiltrates cleared up. Again, these are my laboratory examination results no, from the time I got admitted, and then I just put in there every other day results, so, although I got uh, blood extractions almost every day to monitor the progress. So as I pointed out earlier, my most critical period is from March 23 up to March 27. So you see the results, the LDH went up around three times, the fatin went up three times, SGOT, SGPT also around three times the above normal. And then uh, my D-dimer was also quite high. So medications received. Uh, I, I took Osiltamivir uh, for five days. That was the pre-admission from the time I had my swab and the up to the time I got admitted. I was uh, given azithromycin, the usual dose, for five days, and then chloroquine for seven days no? at uh, 200 milligram, two tablets twice a day. I was given the intravenous uh, antibiotics, PIPTAS, followed by meropenem, followed by cepipine. I was given two, uh, two injections no? of uh, tocilizumab four days apart. And then I was also given topinavir, ritonavir uh, after the first dose of tocilizumab and taken for 14 days. I took also vitamin C, zinc, vitamin B complex, calcium probiotic. I continued my amlodipine. I took uh, racicadotril and loperamide to help stop the uh, loose bowel movement. And then I also took uh, bromazepam starting on my third or fourth day because I could not sleep. Uh, probably because of uh, apprehension, anxiety, etc. And at that time, no, uh, studies were not out yet on anticoagulants and on steroids. So I was not given any anticoagulant. I was not given any steroids at all. As I said, I was prevailed upon by my relatives to take Chinese medicines. So I took a total of four different types of Chinese medicines at different time intervals. So you can just imagine I was taking 20 to 30 tablets uh, every day you know, uh, during the uh, most critical 
uh, period of my illness. So uh, from the DOH registry, you uh, have uh, you have probably seen the data yesterday. We reached almost 90,000 uh, patients with COVID. And at uh, the time I got my uh, problem, no, I was labeled as patient number 280. So I got ill rather early. So what probably worked for me? At that time in March 2020, COVID-19 had no proven therapy. It was really the team effort from all my doctors, the timely interventions from their consensus on what to give me, from the group in Cardinal and from the group in UP. Which medication help? I really don't know. Tocilizumab, which is specific for interleukin-6, lopinavir, ritonavir, the antibiotics, the azithromycin, the chloroquine. You, pro you have also heard lately that uh, chloroquine and lopinavir, ritonavir have been removed from the solidarity trial uh, of the WHO because they felt that these are not helpful at all. What about the Chinese medicines? I'm not sure. I took it together with all the Western medicines. The proning, which was only started on day eight, uh, did uh, help me a lot no? with the pulmonary physiotherapy, the incentive spirometry, and most important, I felt it was the prayers from everyone. My most critical period, as I showed earlier, was from March 23 to April 1st. That was based on laboratory examinations. Yeah? And at that time, uh, my Viber was still on, and I could receive messages of uh, the passing of uh, several colleagues no, from UP. And this is just the list of doctors who passed away when I was in the hospital. And there were other non-UP doctors who also passed away. So it was quite depressing to learn this you know, while you're quite sick. So reflections as a patient. You know? uh, I never thought I would be afflicted with COVID-19 you know, because I felt that I was quite strong. I was quite healthy, although I'm hypertensive and diabetic. But several of us in cardiology were hit, you know, as uh, you have uh, heard earlier. It was really a harrowing uh, frightening experience for me, but I was glad that it was me and not any of my mem uh, family uh, who got it. Fortunately for them, at that time, swab was not recommended if uh, you're not symptomatic. So they never got any swab and they were not symptomatic. It was agonizing wait for a swab result. Uh, it took uh, from uh, March uh, 15 up to March 20, total of six days uh, to get the result at that time. It was uh, extremely difficult for me because, uh, uh, as you all know, being a COVID patient, you are not allowed visitors. No? So I was all alone, isolated, with no visitors and no relatives allowed at all. Uh, it's uh, easy for me as a doctor, but I feel that it, this would be very difficult for any common patient or for the family to accept. I have to do everything on my own move around the room alone, pulling my IV uh, stand, and then with uh, an extended oxygen line, with uh, the recurrent LBM at least two or four times a day, and on IV hydration at two liters a day, I have to go to the washroom every one to two hours. The frequent blood examinations was, uh, were quite painful. No? And uh, at one point when I uh, mentioned that I have blood uh, in the stool, and also uh, blood in, the, uh, in my plant, they suggested a rectal exam. And because uh, they said that uh, one resident noticed that uh, my intake and output was not balanced, offered to put in a Foley catheter, but I refused these two. While waiting for my first swab result, I already anticipated that I might have uh, COVID-19. So being Disney on continuous auto support for several days and almost intubated, I really felt very bad, helpless, despite being a doctor myself. Learning of colleagues that during my critical period made me think of the worst outcome. I'm very thankful for all the support and encouragement by everyone for, for me to keep on fighting. I'm thankful also for all the prayers from many groups, from colleagues, from relatives, from classmates, from friends and patients here and abroad. The emotional and spiritual support were quite important. It's actually a, a spiritual revival for me, I would say. I'm a Protestant uh, by religion, although I'm not that devoted. 
I prayed to God during that time for mercy and put my trust in Him. During my most critical period, I was fortunately enough to be provided with two private duty nurses no, uh, to assist me. The morning shift nurse turned out to be a Protestant like me, a member of the CCF Makati. So I took this as a sign from God that I will survive. Uh, we had daily devotional period uh, after that. It's really God's grace that I'm alive today. So I don't know what is God's mission for me in my remaining years. I'm very thankful to all the attending doctors uh, in Cardinal Santos and to uh, the, uh, the ones in UP as well. Uh, during the first few days, I could hardly talk. So I requested Dr. Luella Santos, my colleague uh, in both hospitals to coordinate uh, everything for me, to, uh, uh, the, uh, to coordinate also with uh, the doctors no, from both sides uh, in my treatment. No? So these are all the doctors from both sides. And at the same time, all uh, the, these people listed on this slide help me one way or another. Uh, uh, they called up uh, a friend in Singapore, Yi Xiong Tai, to see if they can get in the severe. Uh, Sunny Ko of Unilab tried to contact uh, Japan and China for other medications. Uh, and there were so many others who helped me one way or another. Most of all, I'm thankful to my family, to my wife. Benita, to my two sons, Ryan and Russell. And of course, my siblings and my in-laws. They helped me a lot during my critical period. During uh, my confinement, at one point, the hospital refused uh, to deliver anything or any food to me. But somehow, being a consultant, uh, an old consultant in Cardinal, I was able to smuggle food uh, into my room. So I'm thankful <laughs> to everyone who helped one way or another. Uh, before my first presentation in UP, I came across this verse. I thought it's very helpful. So this is from Jeremiah 30, chapter 30, verse 7. For I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds. So thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rodi. Talaga pong, uh, it was well, it was an eye-opener. I think a lot of our participants for really uh, are able to relate, especially those who uh, who were admitted as COVID patients and survived the COVID case. So marami salamat po for sharing your story. It was uh, very emotional and very inspiring at the same time, uh, Sir Rodi. At this point, uh, may we ask uh, well, Dr. Nelson Abelardo po, uh, who was earlier introduced in the video, and also Dr. Camilo Roa to join our panel. If you could uh, turn on po your videos, uh, Dr. Nelson and Dr. Milo po. Uh, so Dr. Milo was the attending physician of uh, Dr. Rodi C uh, during his hospitalization, and he is the global governor of the American College of Chest Physicians. Uh, welcome, everyone. And at the same time, may we also ask... Um, at UP Mandela Chancellor, Carmen Cita Padilla, and College of Medicine Dean Charlotte Chong to also turn on their um, videos po. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Raymond. Um, I think we're going to start with Dr. C, uh, with Dr. C's uh, pulmonologist, Dr. Camilo Roa, um, because uh, there was a point there where he began to desaturate. And there was a point there where it was very important to decide on whether or not he was going to be on a ventilator. And again, Dr. C, thank you so much for sharing this very, very personal uh, narrative. I mean, uh, you're presenting it so objectively, but I can just imagine as you present it, uh, you're remembering what happened to you. And you had friends like Dr. Roa. So Dr. Roa, what was going on in your mind when he was beginning to desaturate? Hi, <clears throat> Susie, thank you. It's, it's really a, a pleasure to be here and uh, I would like to, you, you gave me a, an assignment to <laughs> discuss those uh, problems, the challenges that uh, we were faced in the case of Rodi. So I, I really have to show uh, some slides to, to put the science part of this discussion. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Go ahead, sir. So let me see uh, that one. Okay. So... 
uh, in the process of uh, describing the dilemmas, I will give an update. Okay. So yes, <laughs> we, we were caught <clears throat> uh, unprepared and entirely in a way surprised, even if we heard already the news in China. And it came to us uh, <clears throat> uh, like, uh, you know, something like a, 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 uh, something very bad came from the heavens. And, and, and suddenly upon us, we have people, some we know in the ER intubated and actually not making it. So uh, that's very uh, uh, traumatic as well as, you know, it really got us unprepared. So when, when we <laughs> were faced with this, uh, where do we look for the data? Because uh, this is a new infection. So obviously from China, because uh, the Chinese had it first. And, and uh, they were so gracious enough actually to share it with us. So they had it in December, January, and then we have it in, in March. Okay. So, uh, but, you know, looking at their literature, uh, iba mga Chinese pa. <laughs> and then uh, later they came up with the uh, English uh, uh, translation. Uh, this say here unofficial, and and then somehow we are able we were able to get people to actually talk to us. The head of the Wuhan uh, ICU talked to me uh, early on. That's March 13, and uh, of course as the pandemic spread, we now have uh, more data coming from the traditional areas of the country of the world where we have data like the U.S. and the. Uh, New York experience and in Europe. And uh, with this, we have a better understanding of what, what hit us. Okay, it's a virus. And it just so happened that this virus is attracted to uh, ACE2 receptor, which in the body is present in several sites in the nasopharynx. That's why it comes in usually as an upper respiratory tract infection. And then uh, the more important parts of the body where you have this ACE2, ACE2 receptor and where the interaction with the virus really is uh, like catastrophic will be in the lungs, in the vessels. We have also some diarrhea to explain why we have this manifestation. And uh, what happens is, is the virus comes along and the ACE2 with another enzyme pulls the virus inward into the cell and in the cell the virus replicates as well as the virus triggers a cytokine storm or hyper-release of cytokines. And where there, this thing is happening, there will be damage. And this is the lung. Okay, This is diffuse alveolar damage. Normally, the lung is uh, full of alveoli open, but now this is uh, thickened. And you have uh, proliferation of some cells. You have uh, capillary congestion and uh, even microthrombi. Remember the microtrauma, I'll mention that later. And finally, the lung is becomes thick, uh, congested, and in a way, atelectatic. So that's the uh, end picture of ARDS. So uh, this is what we have now. And, and maybe this will uh, help us understand the medication of Brody. Okay, we have a viral uh, insult. Okay, and that usually... Uh, uh, manifest the effect of the virus, act, uh, you know, the body's uh, reaction to the virus is seen in the in the first week. So there is fever and the symptoms of Roddy. Okay, he was already symptomatic for uh, a few days uh, before he actually got into the hospital. And then later in the hospital, he got worse. And we feel now that the worsening is not directly from the virus, but because of the cytokine storm. Uh, because the effect of the excess cytokine actually is more ravaging to the lung and the other organs uh, in the endothelium and even in the, in the kidneys and, and anywhere where there is uh, ACE2 in, uh, enzymes. Okay, so uh, if we divide it into phases, this is about one week here, all from the virus. This is the second week where you now have the entry of the inflammatory response, the cytokine storm. And if the person is not able to, you know, uh, take care of the, of the storm and in the viremia, the, the uh, patient will go into this uh, advanced stage where there is really lung damage and even fibrosis. So uh, 
in in uh, Rodi's uh, case, he became hypoxemic around here, okay, and then uh, what we gave actually was a anti-inflammatory, and I think the two anti-inflammatory doses of uh, tocilizumab uh, actually helped him because it, there was a real, uh, you know, uh, when the dose was given, he, he felt better. Okay, but of course, that has to be uh, shown in other studies to be really so because uh, there were other medications on board. Okay, so we could actually track this, uh, what's happening uh, uh, with Rodi. And you can track this uh, aside from the clinical radiologic. <coughs> Sorry. If you have the normal <coughs> imaging of the, of the lung, okay, the lung is aerated, so it's black. Now, we are familiar with lung lesion. <coughs> that is uh, really, <coughs> sorry, I assure you this is not COVID. <coughs> sir, take, sir, take a drink muna. Okay. Some water. Uh, so, so when the alveoli are filled up, okay, then that's what <coughs> we usually see. This, is, this becomes white. But when this alveoli is only partially filled up or swollen, this is what we call the GGO. The GGO that is seen early in the, in the stage of uh, COVID in the lungs. So let's follow the clinical course. We have signs and symptoms. The signs and symptoms can be uh, varied, okay? And, uh, but we all know that uh, a good 50% or even more of cases are actually asymptomatic. Among those who develop symptoms, they are considered worse. And if they are unable to shake off the infection, they become worse uh, uh, as the days pass. This is the initial lesion that comes in imaging. This is the GGO. And it comes earlier than the result of the swab. So sometimes we, we make a diagnosis, or many times, as in the case of Nelson, uh, the diagnosis of uh, the COVID infection uh, based on CT scan because the swab takes a while. In this case, it, take, it took five days for the result. And as the condition uh, progresses, okay, so you have more GGO and more thicker actually now, and the lungs fill up. Fill up and this is already crazy paving. And then we sometimes uh, see towards the end, uh, <clears throat> fibrosis. So when we treat this, uh, the patient with COVID, it will be based on what they have, okay? So for example, when the lesions are small or you don't even have lesions, but they feel fever, um, it's only supportive treatment. No need for oxygen. Uh, we don't have antivirals and no need for other medications, okay? But when they uh, get worse, Okay, then the requirement for oxygen goes higher. The breathing becomes difficult. And then we throw in the possibility of infection. Okay, now I will tell you uh, the status now of these treatments that we give, including the treatments that we gave uh, Rodi. Okay, I will uh, uh, just to tell you that, uh, you know, the swabs can be negative too early and what we have in the country is the situation that the swab results come very late. So that's why we have to rely sometimes on imaging. Okay, now I also would like to say at this point that uh, because we don't, we did not understand what was happening. So we were trying to apply the medicine that we know. So when they come with an infiltrate, we apply antibiotics. Uh, in spite of the fact that the WBC is not really high, the procalcitonin is really low, and and this is a viral illness that we are dealing with, but just the same people like Rodi receive antibiotics uh, before coming in and when they come in. Rodi had uh, several antibiotics and I would think that all of them probably did not uh, help him. Okay, now we have this latest publication from WHO that real infection comes in in a very small percentage and they usually come in late especially if intubated. That's why we don't want them to be intubated. So here is the scorecard now. And this is uh, uh, gathered by our uh, uh, 
uh, societies, the PSMID, the infectious disease, PCCP, PCP. And this is the uh, situation of the drugs that we are using. Antibiotics, okay, is, uh, you know, routinely given, is not recommended, okay. But that was a uh, standard of treatment before, okay. Then we have the antiviral, chloroquine, no longer uh, recommended. Uh, the anti uh, uh, HIV medication, no longer recommended. And look at here, we have the other drugs, including tocilizumab, anti inflammatory, and convalescent plasma, hemoperfusion, which we are using now, but we don't really have very good evidence. Even tocilizumab uh, study, uh, the uh, double blind randomized study, came out negative. Although, uh, the minor parameter uh, labeled as uh, it was labeled minor was uh, significant in terms of shorter hospital stay, but the all-cause mortality as well as the clinical improvement did not really matter much. Now, vitamins, we don't have really a uh, uh, evidence. I guess Rodi had uh, most of those. Then steroid. This is very interesting because early on, we were one not to use steroids because in the first SARS, steroids just prolong the viremia and the, uh, you know, positivity of the patient. But then we thought that this is really a inflammatory disease. And now we have data that systemic steroid, this is dexamethasone, a very uh, uh, available, very uh, relatively cheap uh, drug, can actually improve this patient, not against the virus, but against the inflammatory uh, cytokine hyper response. And you see the effect when they are worse, you have the uh, dexamethasone actually showing more efficacy. When they are on ventilator, when they are put on oxygen, but there is no efficacy uh, value when they are not on oxygen. So mild ones should not uh, be treated with the steroids. And you may even have the problem of uh, prolonged viral shedding. Okay. Now, we now have also remdesivir, okay? And uh, the data here shows that it also uh, shortens the hospital stay, recovery time. Unfortunately, the data is not so strong, okay? So the uh, approval for remdesivir is, you know, uh, really uh, just for compassionate use or clinical trial. Unfortunately, we don't still have at this time uh, an antiviral. And the TOSI was uh, uh, turned out to be actually a negative study. Although we have here uh, some uh, improvement in hospital uh, days, uh, shorter hospital days. This has to be studied. But I think in Rodi's case, he, he really uh, improved. Now, the other thing uh, that we fear is intubation. Why? Because in the data from, from China, okay, they made a very nice uh, uh, study with, in, in patients with complete information and compared the survivors and the non-survivors. And you see the difference between the survivor and the non-survivor? The fact that the non-survivors were intubated. Well, that could be a marker of the disease. It's the marker of severity, but also it may be that uh, you know, intubation carries a lot of complications as well. And we now know that uh, a uh, patient with uh, COVID becoming hypoxemic does not really need early intubation. That was, you know, uh, the, the trend before. When the patient uh, desaturates, put, put a tube in and uh, ventilate the patient. I think uh, with the science we have now, we are able to prevent or reduce death by close to 50%, maybe at least, by not uh, having them intubated. And you know, Rodi uh, said that uh, intubation I don't like. And so it's very hard to, to go against your boss. But really, uh, this is his situation. He was hypoxemic, yes. That's why his breathing is uh, difficult. Uh, but it was not due to something like ARDS, where the lungs are really stiff. Okay, he was hypoxemic. Uh, because of uh, some features in this uh, new disease, where if you actually uh, do imaging, you see that in the area of 
damage in the lungs, and you saw the GGO areas of Rodi, you have also involvement of the vessels. And what happened to the vessels? The vessels in the area of a pneumonia normally become smaller. The uh, pulmonary artery uh, arterioles will constrict normally to uh, deflect the blood flow from the sick area to the working area and therefore improve the oxygen transfer. Now what happens in COVID, and this is really in a way unique for this disease, which we learn uh, later, that uh, instead of constricting, the, the vessel in the area of the lung lesion, parenchymal lesion, actually dilates. And then now the blood here, unoxygenated, passes through still unoxygenated, creating hypoxemia. So what is the solution here? The solution here is not really to push the oxygen in or pressure the lungs with a ventilator uh, because the lungs are not stiff, okay? It's a, it's a mismatch of the ventilation and perfusion. So what is now being done, and this is a game changer as I alluded to, is to enrich the oxygen that the patient inhales. Now, you see, if we inhale right now, if you inhale, okay, the instantaneous flow requirement is something like 20 liters. But if you have 10 liters in the, in the oxygen line and put here, it cannot supply you the 20 liters. So you will have to entrain environmental air and therefore you cannot enrich the air uh, to the point that will relieve the hypoxemia. So with this machine, now we have uh, a way of giving up to 100%. And uh, in a commensurate flow that you drive away the dead space, the carbon dioxide, and just put in oxygen. And at a very comfortable uh, manner, no, no tube, no entry of bacterial uh, secondary infection or, 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 or ventilator associated pneumonia. So this is a game changer. And I'm so glad that Rodi insisted, wag niyo akong intubate. And we tried to uh, support him with this uh, device. Although we had to, you know, we were worried because his requirement was uh, going up. In addition to, to buy time for, you know, oxygen, uh, to, to allow oxygen to come in easier, we prone him. Okay, so finally, and uh, the reason for the improvement with the proning, and this can be dramatic, you know, in my patients with uh, already on ventilator and they are very uh, bad oxygenation the oxygen saturation can become 100% just by proning, okay? And the reason being that uh, the blood flow of the lungs is at the back, okay? But if he is uh, supine, the aeration of the lung is in the front because, you know, the expansion here is easier than here against the, the bed. So if the person is prone, okay? Now you have the... Uh, perfusion at the back, you have now better aeration also at the back. So you, you actually facilitate gas uh, exchange. And that adds to the oxygenation. Again, buying time. Buying time, I repeatedly mentioned because in the final thought, what will take care of the virus, what will kill the virus is the body himself. Just allow him to, to uh, be afloat, okay? Not get intubated. And then, as Rodi mentioned, one day he said, I feel better, okay? But doing proning is uh, not easy, okay? This is uh, my patient now in the ICU. And, you know, uh, turning somebody with tubes can be very difficult. It uh, requires a lot of people. You need more PPEs. And sometimes there are accidents during the act of uh, turning. But Rodi has to do it uh, still on his own because... Uh, Awake pa siya, not intubated. So you can also do it before intubation after it happens. And lastly, this situation now that uh, we didn't recognize before. In the autopsies of COVID patients in Europe, okay, there were a lot of clots, blood clots. And we now know that uh, the inflammatory response, the hyper response also creates a, you know, uh, a ground for more clots to form. So right now, we use uh, uh, anticoagulants uh, in this patient, uh, prophylactic dose when they are not so bad, but when they get uh, into critical, we give them full dose prophylaxis. 
And unfortunately, we were not able to give that to Rodney. And before I end, I'd just uh, like to put this uh, on the table now, this one, that even after recovery, uh, patients don't fully uh, feel better immediately. Uh, sometimes it takes months for them to finally re re recover or e e even longer. And that's because of the this kind of uh, infection, this virus and the cytokine storm that uh, uh, goes with it really affects the whole body. And, and while you see the lungs cleared, the rest of the body is not yet uh, that well. So the, the persistent heart manifestation, I'd like to ask Rodi how long it took him to, to fully re, feel fully recovered, if he is fully recovered now, uh, because that's something that we, we have to consider, even in some cases, the, the, mental, the mental state of the patient. So I'll end now. And uh, with this slide that uh, just tells us that the, the mental health uh, uh, situation that happens to patients also actually goes to the caregivers. And, uh, you know, uh, many of my boys there in PGS are already, in a way, almost burned out because they've been taking care of, of patients. So I'd like to stop here. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Roa. Um, and um, I think there was a good uh, question, Dr. Roa. Of course, an excellent presentation. Remember, Dr. Roa was our first webinar speaker, and they were already talking about proning on April 29 when we first started. And now uh, it, it's just shown how we have advanced in our understanding and our ability to explain what works and doesn't work. And we're going to hear more from Dr. Roa. I think you had a good question for Dr. C, which was, how are you doing now? Because, sabi ni Dr. Roa, recovery could take months for some people. Sir, how are you feeling these days? I'm feeling fine. No, I have uh, no uh, problem at all uh, respiratory-wise. I uh, go out uh, every day to walk for one hour, and I could cover almost four kilometers with my walking. Wow. <laughs> Okay, mukhang marami tayong natalo doon, ha? So, sir, be, so very active and your recovery has gone really well. We'd like to get uh, a, few, a few insights also from the other cardiologist who got COVID-19. And um, it's just an amazing story uh, about the three of them with Dr. Hara. But I, I, I think we also want to hear Dr. Nelson Abilardo, who was also former... Uh, head of the cardiology division of the Philippine General Hospital. So, Dr. Nelson, welcome to the webinar, and um, uh, please share your please share your 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 insights on uh, Dr. Rodi's uh, journey and also your own journey. Okay, thank you very much, Susie, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Madam Dean. Uh, uh, Roddy has been my predecessor in the department, but he came in almost at the same time. And uh, it is natural now to follow him as always. But uh, he mentioned about he narrated his medical experience. And Milo uh, uh, discussed about the science of uh, uh, treating or managing patients with COVID infection. I will not try to attempt to follow through with my narrative that focuses on the thoughts and feelings that interplayed within me as a doctor patient. After all, emotions are what makes us human. You know, doctors as a specialized group of, of uh, professionals uh, are really the chosen ones, uh, so to speak, because uh, if you remember the Darwinian theory of, of survival of the fittest, there is no other profession that one subjects the members to than in medicine, because you spend 15 years of study, training, 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 and more training, so that even after you graduate from medical school, you still study and train some more in order to become excellent in your profession. Now, uh, I think uh, doctors are survivalists. They possess basically the IQ, they have the so-called EQ, emotions. They have the SQ, or social quotient. And then finally, they have the so-called AQ, reason. 
And this is adversity quotient, the ability to bounce back from any failure or setbacks that we probably would encounter in the future during practice. So they build their own kingdoms, little by little, brick by brick, until such time that they reach a certain point or status in life. So we can describe doctors as king, kings and queens in their own right. I, I would probably consider myself as very fortunate because uh, I am quite healthy. I, I just have uh, mild uh, hypertension or pre-hypertension, pre-diabetes, a little obese, uh, but that's just about all. So uh, I am functional. I have not been sick of any major illness except one episode of uh, uh, gallbladder problem, which was removed. And I maintain generally a healthy lifestyle. So when the COVID uh, infection struck uh, after that fateful meeting at Clark, uh, March 7, and I found out uh, March 19, I had a single episode of fever and uh, I thought I would consult my doctor and, and run to the hospital. And uh, I suspected I might have contracted COVID because uh, uh, our colleague, uh, came with the COVID infection. Just about at the same time, March 20, that Rolly was admitted to Cardinal Santos, I got myself admitted to Manila Doctors Hospital. Uh, I guess that uh, when you are very uh, confident with yourself, a job like this would probably take its toll. And so therefore, uh, uh, when I was brought to the uh, CD scan the Department of Radiology, and they found out that I had glass, uh, ground glass capacity in my lungs and was brought immediately to the isolation floor. I said, this is it. And I thought that this is going to be the last time that I will see, see my wife or my family. And uh, all these uh, morbid things went through my mind. I heard there were four doctors in my floor and two were, of them just passed on. Colleagues of mine, I personally knew and uh, Raul Hara was admitted uh, at the heart center. Okay, I could not help but think that I may be next and I wanted to talk to someone but could not. The staff were not around and if ever they came to the room, it was just a fleeting moment with the PPEs that they could hardly see their faces. Yes, they were there, near, and yet they were so far away. At that moment, I felt so all alone and I could not turn to anyone else. Nobody to talk to, nobody to hold, nobody to lean on. I thought that I had everything in this world, but I had nothing. I was shattered and reduced to nothing. And I became desperate. And in my desperation, I found myself saying, please God, help me. Thoughts passed through my mind. And I said, Lord, if you are going to take me, would you at least forgive me? The thought of dying sent shivers to my deepest recesses of the body. I will die devoid of dignity because I will be dispensed with or disposed of as a COVID patient and cremated immediately without the benefit of your family with you. And I will leave my wife alone. We will die sometime and somehow, but the thought of dying spiritually unprepared was terrifying. And our Christian faith tells us of consequences. I ask my Lord and Savior to forgive me and to take care of my wife in case I go. I stripped myself of everything and surrendered at the foot of his cross at that time, saying, Lord, if this is your will, then let it be done. After that, I felt some inner calm and peace and mustered some courage. Well, they say courage is fear that has said it's prayer. So I was ready, but uh, I thought that maybe the Lord would give me another chance. After a few days, I stayed in the hospital for a total of eight days. And on the fourth or fifth day, my acute inflammatory markers stabilized. They didn't go up, you know, steady. And later on in a uh, matter of another two or three days, the inflammatory markers slowly subsided. And so my attending physicians must have felt confident 
to discharge me on the eighth hospital day with instructions for home care. When I look back at those harrowing events in my life, I guess that the turning point was my resignation to the fact that I was helpless and could not do anything more and I needed somebody to cling to for hope and strength. I think it was God because he was always there. Only that I did not ask him to come in. And when I did, he came perfectly at the right moment when I needed him. His timing was perfect because when I was weakest, he was strongest. Again, the turning point was total surrender to the Lord and placing myself at the foot of his cross. A young colleague who gave me a booklet entitled Finding God later asked me, well, have you read it and found God? And I replied, my reply was, how could I not find God? Or how could not I find him? He was just beside me all these times. I'm a man of science trained in the discipline of uh, logical and scientific reasons and evidence-based uh, medicine. The medications given to me all had probable mechanism of action that could affect COVID, but the body of evidence showed conflicting data. Honestly, I am not sure what worked. I assured, uh, I, uh, I assume something must have been effective. But what I realized is there was something more that gave me the final push to stability and recovery. And I thought it was God. I'm now on my 130th day from admission since March 20, tested negative two times with positive antibody test, and I'm still okay. I now realize that health is the real wealth. In the end, nothing and nothing like fame, fortune, social or work status, or even power really matters except me and my God. It is really your deep relationship with God, the only one who can make you whole and can truly save. So no matter how good life is, something can strike at the most unexpected moment. No matter how healthy you feel, you should never take it for granted. Well, I took the bullet but I'm just thankful that it was not my wife or my family. In my solitude, various thoughts swirled in my mind and I stared at death straight in the eyes and it was terrifying. The emotional backlash of being admitted and confined as a COVID patient was tremendous. There was a lot of worry, anxiety, fear, knowing that you will die devoid of human dignity and any time, but if I die, I die alone. But it was not so much about dying, then it was about dying spiritually unprepared. And that was the terrifying thing. Alam mo na, saan ka pupunta? Baka mamaya doon sa mainit, no? Now I know how it is to be on the other side of medicine. They drew blood uh, every now and then endless drop of blood, examinations and tests, you can barely sleep. Then here comes another nurse coming in to take your vital signs or draw blood again. I know now how it feels to be a patient. Treating patients is more than just prescribing or giving medications. It is touching their hearts and spirits. Unknown to me, many prayed for me and that I found out later. Prayers gave me strength, and it really works. In my case, I was totally stripped, stripped of everything, and that feeling was really humbling. As I recover, it is a constant struggle to get my life back. In fact, I still have apprehensions on social reintegration. So, just to cap everything, in my hour of greatest weakness and need, I found God, the only one who truly saves, with his mercy and grace. Mercy being defined as something like God or you are spared of a punishment that you deserve. And grace is when God gives you something that you do not deserve. 
And so when he's generous with both, then it is called blessings. So our faith tells us that it sees the invisible, believes the improbable, and receives the impossible. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abelardo. That was really an inspiring story, po. No, thank you for being honest and being open, po, in sharing your story. Uh, we really appreciate it. And before we ask the next question, I think um, uh, on behalf of everyone, po, we would like to express how happy we are, how elated we are that both Dr. Rodi and Dr. Nelson. Uh, have overcome COVID and they are still with us. We are really um, elated because uh, because your mission, like I mentioned, like mentioned po in the chat box, po, that's something that uh, you still uh, have yet to finish. I uh, that, that's the prevailing notion, po, and we really are very very fortunate that we still have you to this day. Um, so the next question, po, it touches on the uh, what Dr. Nelson just recently mentioned, po, ano po? Uh, with regards to apprehensions, anxieties, or fears for regarding social integration. So now that you have recovered, uh, that's for Doc, Dr. Roddy and for Dr. Nelson. So how much of a factor po ba yung, uh, let's say, how do I protect myself? Sana hindi ako ma-reinfect. Because uh, for, for, like, for example, po, for my patients that I have been seeing, that has been the primary concern po kasi parang how do I go back to society, how do I go back to my pre-being infected routine? So, how much of a factor does that really affect you, let's say, on a day-to-day -day basis? Po? Let's start with uh, Dr. Roddy before Dr. Nelson. Po. Dr. Roddy? Yes. Uh, I, uh, well, after uh, getting hit with COVID, I've been very careful already. I have been warned by uh, a lot of people uh, to be extremely careful. So, I have not uh, been going back to the clinic yet. Uh, I uh, do uh, video calls or telemedicine uh, the uh, for the last month and uh, I uh, do exercises every day and then uh, try to uh, uh, take healthy food no, as much as possible. So uh, I guess it will be some time before I resume my clinic. Thank you, Sir Roddy. And for uh, Dr. Nelson, Pop, uh, may we hear your thoughts, Paul, sir, on, on that question? Well, I, uh, thank you. I, I guess that uh, having had this experience really uh, 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 forces you to rethink about your option. The, thing, the first thing that happens is that you try to be very careful uh, with yourself to the point of being paranoid. Uh, you see other people as uh, potentially being a COVID patient and he or she is going to infect you when he comes near. So, oops, don't come near to me. So you exercise precaution by social distancing. You wear the proper protective uh, equipment like mask and even face shield and put in your gloves when you touch something. You don't socialize. So we've been keeping to ourselves largely confined to our homes. What about practice? Uh, the calling of a profession is something that uh, says that you cannot really neglect your patient. So even in the comfort of your home, you still attend to your patient, you take their calls, you prescribe medications, and uh, you attend to them uh, as, as uh, much as you can. Uh, but the most important thing is you talk to them. You talk to them and give them the assurance and the reassurance that everything's going to be fine and that your prayers are always with them. Thank you, Dr. Nelson and Dr. Roddy. So, Dr. Susi, go ahead. Oh, so I think um, we're going to ask uh, Dean, uh, Dean Charlotte and uh, Chancellor Menchie to also come into this discussion. And um, I was going to ask uh, Dean, Dean Charlotte to respond a little to the uh, presentation of Dr. Roa because I think what we saw today was the state of the art of treatment, which he beautifully captured in uh, 10, 15 minutes. So I was going to ask uh, Dean Charlotte to, to respond to that and what this means for uh, teaching and training of, of our doctors and all those people who are listening to us right now. Well, as you can see, this is a disease that has, has continued to evolve. No? Um, I think at the outset, we had, we had a lot of mortalities because we didn't really know how to treat it. 
But we now have a deeper understanding of what it is. Uh, and I think that's the reason why our mortality rates now are going down. Uh, we have access to the medications and we have, um, we have a better understanding of the pathophysiology, as you can see, as was presented by Dr. Loa. And uh, the mutation of the virus has been found. Uh, it has mutated. And uh, thank God that we have also the Philippine Genome Center because the initial swabs that we had were analyzed. And we now know that uh, the particular gene, um, a characteristic of the, the, the COVID-19 that's in the Philippines. And I think that's going to help us even further. Um, so we know it's more uh, infectious, but less uh, fatal. And I think uh, that's reassuring in a sense, because uh, then uh, we have a better ammunition uh, against this, uh, this virus. Our, our doctors are actually getting more experience as well with how to treat this disease. And uh, I think if we are able to balance out the, the optimal treatment in the hospitals and the community intervention that's supposed to happen where people are following the, the guidelines of uh, mass, wearing a mask, social distancing and hand washing, I think uh, we have a better chance of winning this war. And I think it's, a, it's really a, a whole of society approach. So, so as the doctors are getting more experience and the hospitals are able to cope with the disease, I think in the communities, our lo local leaders should be able to control and quarantine and isolate those who might be having uh, COVID or mild COVID perhaps they should be quarantined. I think this is the this is the key. Dito yata kulang eh. I, I, I know from my personal experience, my own helper, walang quarantine facility in the barangay. So she cannot go back there. So she has to go back to, to her home province kasi doon mas may quarantine pa kaysa dito sa Manila. But then she has to undergo all the other testing like uh, ELISA testing to find out what's the if she has already antibodies, no? So there's a role for antibody testing at the, at the later part, which might give you an, an idea that the, perhaps the patient already has some uh, protection against the virus, but we don't know how long it will last, whether it's going to last for one month, two months, three months, we don't know. And that, I think that's the reason why Dr. Rodisi and Dr. Nelson Abilardo being, having had COVID are still very much afraid, no? To go, up, to go back to the clinic because they don't know where the, that immunity is going to pr protect them for how long. I think that's the key question. Yeah, thank you very now. much. Thank you, Dean. I mean, I think, I think you're right. I think the, the big gap now is really in the area of uh, isolation. And, uh, you know, there have been conversations about maybe we should just be converting all of the schools because, uh, you know, we're not doing yeah. face to face learning all of those public elementary schools can be actually converted. But we're not here to talk about policy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is just, uh, you know, we're just exchanging some ideas. Uh, Chancellor Manchit, uh, your thoughts on, um, on the presentations, please. I just want to respond first to your question about, you know, about all of these cases. So PGH now has a lot of um, experience. And I think we have a responsibility to document what we are observing so that we can come up with better recommendations that can be shared with the rest of the community. So if we do have some findings or some observations, they, are, they cannot be used for recommendations. They cannot be used for policy if you don't write it up. So that's the first, that's the first uh, I think, responsibility of, uh, of UP and the PGH and the College of Medicine and the rest. The second is, I just want to share with you that as of my last count, there are 216 researchers just on COVID for the past five months. It ranges anywhere from clinical trials to psychological uh, effects, to ventilators, to gadgets. And again, I want to thank the community because uh, you know, if you look at it, COVID has actually stimulated the minds of our, of our faculty and researchers and students and staff to come up actually with certain projects that can respond to a question. Because as Dr. Roa said, there is so much that's evolving with this condition. So once again, I want to thank the community for keeping on coming up with these questions. 
But now reacting to the two presentations, I, I want to take the, the non-clinical part in the, the sharing of the two. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Dr. Rodisi and Dr. Nelson and Dr. Roa for giving us both sides of it, no? the personal one and then now the, the medical one. And there are a few things that um, Dr. C and Dr. Nelson actually mentioned. And that's where the compassion factor of doctors come in. You know, they say that compassion and empathy are supposed to be foundational for, for doctors. But time has shown that they can be enhanced, they can be enriched. And uh, we have to do that as an exercise for doctors. For instance, uh, Dr. Rodisi was mentioning that, you know, we, we tend to forget, uh, you know, he wanted to eat. But, you know, we doctors are, are so strict. But... Uh, there's we, you've got to be a bit sensitive to how they feel and the feeling of being alone and getting somebody to talk to them even from a distance uh, these are very non-medical things but i think we should appreciate that we have to find a way to reach out to them so maybe for us in the administration as trainers you know and maybe the challenge for us uh, dean charlotte is how do we bring in this kind of lessons to our students, to our residents, to our fellows? Because yung pagiging compassionate, you know, it has to be, it, yes, we say it's built in, but I think we have to, more than ever, we should be compassionate and learn these lessons. And there's something that Dr. Roa said at the end, it's not just the doctors, even the health workers need it. So when you look at the whole game, it's not, we're not just dealing with the doctors, but also with the patients. So I think, you know, this is an excellent lesson for compassion and we should be more conscious with this kind of sharing because it's so hard to teach it. You have to hear it from the patients themselves and that we're just lucky that we're hearing it from doctors themselves telling us, hey, you know, when I was sick, this is how I felt. And maybe it's also the time for us to reflect and we were sick when we were operated on, when we were, you know, in bed, how did we feel? Because that's the way our patients feel when they're actually there in the other side. And as Dr. Nelson said, it's different when you're in the other side of the game. And we don't have to get to that point, but listen to the lessons, listen to the stories so that, you know, we can, uh, we can be better doctors eventually. Thank you, Chancellor. Okay. So Raymond, let's take a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Go ahead. So but before that, uh, Dr. Susie, I think this is the time when we could uh, share our uh, presenter polls. That's tradition po kasi after um, the presentation. So for those who are um, in the Zoom webinar and are able to put in your, um, well, your, your answers po for this uh, uh, questions, uh, mainly on how the presentation came about. And as uh, all of the questions are trickling in, uh, this is the point wherein we introduce, well, list down po yung mga nakalista po sa ating mga um, registrants. So right now, we have 1,848 oh. registrants to date. This is the highest uh, in the, well, in the, in the 15 webinars that we have had. And, and in addition, we are full house as mentioned po earlier. Uh, dito po sa Zoom webinar and also we have more than 300 who are tuning in sa live stream po ng uh, YouTube. So maraming salamat po sa lahat-lahat po na, na, na sumausubaybay at nag-tune in po para po sa ating webinar uh, for today uh, featuring Dr. Rodi C. For our registrants, we have those who have, re uh, who have registered and attending po all the way from the Indigenous People's Hospital in Aritao, Cagayan Valley in Region 2 the University of Northern Philippines, Alamut, Ifugao, Cordillera Administrative Region, the Philippine College of Occupational Medicine from Batangas in Calabarzon, the Provincial Government of Aklan from Calibo Aklan in Western Visayas, Siliman University Medical Center from Bantan, Bukadini City, Central Visayas, and uh, Pangutaran District Hospital from Pangutaran, Sulu, in Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. And as mentioned also earlier, I uh, just wanted to share to Dr. Rodi C, Dr. Nelson Abelardo, and Dr. Roa. Uh, pinapanood po tayo outside of the Philippines. We have those who are tuning in uh, all the way from Moscow in Russia, from Ontario, Canada, from Laguna, Nigel in California, from San Ramon in California, Surakarta in Indonesia, 
and from the NTC, CNTCM Medical Clinic Singapore and the Health Hub in Al Futaim Dubai uh, United Arab Emirates. So Emirates. So lahat lahat po yon uh, have been successful in terms of uh, tuning in, and we are very happy to for them to be able to uh, join us. And as you can see, uh, we are sharing for the poll results. Overwhelmingly, the presentation, as always, has been very well received. Uh, so the present the presenter for demonstrated thorough knowledge, a well prepared and organized, uh, and spoke clearly and audibly. Uh, very very consistent with our previous webinars po. Uh, maraming salamat sa lahat po ng sumagot ng ating presenter polls. And at this point, uh, let's start with the Q and A uh, questions. Uh, so for our Q and A, um, and this question has been upvoted, and this is for Dr. Camilo Roa. Uh, the question reads: Would an oxygen concentrator help COVID-19 patients? Sir Milo. Yes, thank you very much for that question. But before I do that, actually, since it's an opportunity, I'd like to echo the concern of Chancellor and uh, Dean Charlotte uh, on, on the healthcare worker. Because I think in our system, one of the weakest in the link is the healthcare worker. And this is a disease that uh, takes them off uh, some time. You know, they have to quarantine themselves and wala nang matira. And this thing is going to go on for a while. So you man the duty. Okay lang, first month, second month, fifth month na, and so on. Talagang nagpapatig sila. And, you know, we just have to talk to them kasi minsan nahihiyam magsabi doon sa, sa mga yeah. ano, admin. So that's, that's just a message. Now, as far as oxygen concentrator, what it does is to, uh, in the air around us, uh, put off the oxygen part only. So uh, very good in providing 100% oxygen in the line that comes to the nose, for example, if the concentrator is rated five liters or 10 liters, unfortunately, our requirement is can be more than that. When we inhale, we actually need 20 liters, okay? And and the disease might be such that that is not enough anymore. So, uh, well and fine if you have that. If it's not enough, we put a mask where there is some reservoir reserve oxygen that are in train in addition to one that just came in. But uh, in COVID, you really get into very bad hypoxemia that you need a machine like had a high flow nasal uh, catheter setup. Now that device actually is not very expensive. It costs one fifth, one tenth of a ventilator, and it saves people from getting intubated and having to be placed in a ventilator where the, the outcome can be actually dire. Thank you, thank you, Sir Milo. Uh, just a follow up to that question, po. Does that mean na uh, uh, mas efficient po ba yung high flow oxygen, uh, or because dahil po nakaram po ng apnea si Dr. Rodi? No, it's uh, it's not for sleep apnea. It's uh, it's the, the pressures really are in terms of like a CPAP effect is only one cm water, very little. But it's the concentration of the air that one inhales. You can fill it up hundred percent. I mean. Uh, no need of entraining air from the environment. But it will work until also up to a limit. When the disease is really very bad, then you need a ventilator. But most of them actually turn around. They become well. The viremia is spontaneously resolved uh, in most cases before they actually need the ventilator. Thank you, Sir Milo. And uh, last question from me before I turn over to Dr. Susi. Uh, very, very common question that we are getting po, and this is the most upvoted. Uh, since the pharynx is the entry point, uh, would you recommend uh, using betadine gargle, sir? And, and unfortunately, uh, the cell actually gets intracellular quickly. I mean, before you notice it, uh, even prophylactically, it doesn't assure that it will not get regularly. Uh, the uh, cell's uh, synthetic uh, capacity now is uh, due to viruses, uh, and, and this will now go to the blood, and you, you, you will uh, have it in the whole body in no time. It cannot be uh, captured or prevented or even mitigated by antiseptics. Thank you for answering that question. That it is really important po kasi that uh, the, the audience po hears it directly from the experts po para there's a, some sort of authority on, on that question po. Dr. Susie, go ahead. Okay, so I think we're really running out of time. We'd love to continue this conversation, but 
we're close to we're close to the end of the time that we have allotted for this webinar. And um, I just like to ask Dr. Rodisi to um, give a parting message to us. I think Dr. Roa is correct. Actually, this whole episode has been about the health worker. It's been it's been about doctors. It's it's about it's about those who are caring for those who are sick, but also about us getting sick and knowing what it's like and how we can do a better job. And so, um, let me call on Dr. Uh, Rodisi to say uh, a parting message for everyone. Well, uh, what I can say at this point is that we really have to be very careful. We cannot be complacent. Now, to the frontliners, the, uh, you have to follow all the advice, all the instructions given to you in uh, protecting yourself because uh, this is uh, an enemy that uh, we cannot see, but it is very contagious. And uh, we really have uh, to exercise caution in fighting against uh, this problem. Thank you very much, Dr. C. And uh, we might forget the answers to the question, Raymond, the questions <laughs> earlier. Uh, that is true. That is true. Um, may we have the uh, post-webinar questions, Paul, be flashed on the screen so we can... Um, okay. So I'll, I'll read the questions, uh, Dr. Roddy, and perhaps you could provide the correct answers po, as tradition, sir. So for the qu first question, it reads... The following are risk factors for increased mortality when afflicted with COVID-19, except? The uh, answer is correct, no? Except female sex. Although uh, females are also affected, but uh, the data showed that males are more affected than females. The other uh, entities there are all correct. Thank you, Sir Roddy. Uh, second question reads, the cytokine storm occurs during which time period of the illness? Uh, the answer is uh, balanced between the first and second week, but uh, to me, it's actually the second week. From the course of my illness, uh, uh, the uh, cytokine storm or all the inflammatory markers occurred during the second week. And I think this is also collaborated by Dr. Roa with his presentation. Thank you, uh, Sir Rodi. And finally, for your last question, Sir, uh, which medication has been seen to be effective against the coronavirus? Again, as uh, shown by uh, the presentation of Dr. Roa, at this point, it is only remdesivir that is considered to be effective. Although uh, maybe uh, we need more data no? because this is still under study. The others, uh, or uh, uh, we have uh, said earlier, uh, chlor chloroquine and then the uh, lopinavir have been uh, discontinued, at least uh, in the solidarity study. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Roddy. And before we have our um, closing remarks, uh, speaker to give her uh, final message. For me, we have uh, the final message naman po from Dr. Nelson Abelardo. Sir Nelson. Well, uh, we think that the front line should be in the healthcare facilities and the healthcare workers. I honestly think that the front line of uh, the fight against COVID should be shifted towards the general population. We owe, a, we owe uh, these things upon ourselves to take good care of ourselves. And if you prevent the infection from jumping over from one person to the other, then maybe we shall have done the country a very, very good thing uh, because we prevent the spread of infection. So uh, that should be the message that uh, uh, should be given to everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Abilardo. Um, we're going to have a closing remark also from Chancellor uh, Padilla. Just a few words. Well, COVID-19 allowed another opportunity for creativity. Whereas, you know, before we said, as Dr. Susie said, we used to have a face-to-face -face grand round. We now have the virtual grand rounds. And today has been such an excellent uh, way to start the series. And there are a few lessons we have to remember. The doctor is a patient and the doctor is a doctor. And the doctor is a patient, a few things. You have to trust your medical team. Two, these are times when you have deep appreciation of the things that value in your life, like the family and friends. And as both uh, Dr. Roddy and Dr. Nelson said, you really just have to trust God. But there's such a thing as uh, the lessons for the doctor. For us doctors, the lesson really is that 
when we're dealing with such an unknown, we have to bring in everybody on board. It has to be a team effort. The second, which I mentioned, is that we've got to be sensitive. We've got to be very sensitive to the feelings of our patients. And the third, we are just instruments. And um, at the end of the day, uh, no matter how hard we try, uh, God has to make a decision that whether a patient can be saved or not saved. And as uh, Dr. Nelson said, health is wealth. So thank you again to UP and PhilHealth for season two of Stop COVID Deaths. We look forward to an excellent series for the next couple of weeks, and we hope that we can bring back the audience that we have. Thank you, Dr. Susie, and thank you again, Dr. Raymond. Thank you, uh, Chancellor Padilla, for that wonderful closing remarks. Po. Uh, at this point, you are seeing uh, the polls for the post-webinar questions, so please continue to answer them if you are able to. Uh, I'll give the floor to Dr. Susie just to give like a brief, uh, maybe one to two sentence po on what to expect for the next week's webinar. Dr. Susie. Okay, so uh, thank you again, Dr. Rodisi, Dr. Abilardo, uh, Dr. Uh, Camilo Roa, Dean, um, Dean Charlotte Chong, and Chancellor Padilla. What, uh, what should I say? Star-studded start we had for the Grand Rounds. And next week, be with us again on Friday. We have a story about a mother who tested negative for COVID-19, but gave birth to a baby who was positive for COVID. So, abangan natin yan, no? And we'll have more of these interesting stories as we continue. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you again. I'd like to reiterate uh, the message from Dr. Susie Mercado for, for our fantastic panel and, spe and especially po for uh, Dr. Rodisi and Dr. Nelson Abelardo for sharing their journeys as patients. Po. So as mentioned, uh, sana po makita-kita po tayo ulit uh, every Friday from 12 to 2 p.m. And this is just the start of our season two uh, for the virtual Grand Rounds. And together, we can stop COVID deaths po. So keep safe, keep healthy, and see you online. The enemy remains unseen. I'll keep your hand in mine. Let's say a prayer one more time. I know you long for home, but I am here, you're not alone. I'll stay with you until the coast is clear. The others faint before my fears, the others laugh before my tears, but right behind the mask, I look into myself and ask. Do I have strength to carry on? My God, how long will this go on? I need you here to keep me strong. I'm here to hold the line. I'll keep my word until my time. Just look into my eyes and say his name to realize. It's fine to be afraid. Just hold on to the word he gave. This time will come to pass Cause this salvation's made to last He'll carry you to see the break of day The others pain before my fears The others vows before my tears But right behind the mask I look into myself and ask do I have strength to carry on? But God, how long must this go on? I need you here to keep me strong. I'm here to hold the line. I'll keep my word until my head dies. Yeah.
I will 